Uh, in, in the interest of time, I would like to uh, immediately continue uh, with the next session, um, together with uh, Michael Reid from Brisbane in Australia. My name is Mark Megele. I'm a, a trauma surgeon from Cologne in Germany. We have the privilege um, to, to host um, this um, um, afternoon session on um, the clinical use of ultrasound, a very interesting um, technique, non-invasive, that obviously gives us uh, some windows into the various parts of the body. Um, I think we have a, a panel of uh, very interesting and knowledgeable speakers, um, and uh, I would like to call up our Arti Saval. Um, giving her um, lecture on um, the role of ultrasound in resuscitation. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having me here. Um, so I'll be doing the first of these resuscitation talks and doing a more practical case-based review of how ultrasound can help in resuscitation. And we'll end the talk with discovering some caution and some pitfalls um, uh, for people who are new to the field of ultrasound and resuscitation uh, to be careful about. Uh, here are a few of my disclosures, um, uh, some relative to ultrasound, but nothing, relatively, um, nothing relative directly to the content of the um, uh, course itself, and obviously I'm a neurologist, and that's kind of my standard disclosures to all. Um, so all of us are familiar with the burden of cardiac arrest um, and the um, uh, emergent role of research in resuscitation and improving outcomes. All of you guys are familiar whether we're talking about in-hospital arrest, which we more often get to see uh, compared to pre-hospital um, emergency providers that get to see more out-of-hospital arrest, the outcomes continue to be pretty dismal. Um, depending upon the source that you read, uh, the data on the left here um, represents um, the AHA data, and the da uh, on the right, um, uh, there was a recent commission by Lancet um, on a call to action for sudden cardiac death, and in trying to distinguish that from cardiac arrest, that graph basically points out where all the data is coming from, mostly westernized uh, data with some uh, contribution from Australia, China, and India, um, and some from South America, but um, no matter where you look at, um, the overall survival of cardiac arrest is pretty dismal. Um, about 75 to 90% fatality, and even the ones that survive, um, uh, there is only one in 10 people go on to hospital discharge with any amount of um, decent functional outcomes. So where does ultrasound play a role in this um, advanced life support, advanced cardio, cardiac life support, or cardiac arrest management uh, in the whole scheme of things? Um, the shockable rhythms are a little more easier, but the non-shockable rhythms typically have a whole gamut of um, uh, etiology, and ultrasound can be a really good point of care tool to and narrow down these etiologies. Uh, people have also started looking at ultrasound markers of prognosis of survival, and I'll show you one or two descriptive cases. And then assess the quality of compressions, which is an ongoing area of research. Um, uh, people have started realizing that some chest compressions um, could be actually causing LVOT obstruction, um, and ultrasound is a very good visual uh, way of looking at that. Not as much transthoracic, but there's an emerging role of TEE, transesophageal echocardiography in that space. And um, people have also started realizing that pulse checks in general um, are unreliable. And this phenomenon of pseudo-PEA has been recognized recently that ultrasound can really help uh, elucidate. So the easiest thing is to actually look at the heart and see what kind of arrest it is. Um, if you're coding this patient, um, CPR is ongoing and you're uh, performing ultrasound in between uh, the CPR, um, obviously you have a good sense of whether you're treating a shockable, non-shockable rhythm, but if there is a disconnect rarely um, between what you're seeing on the telemetry and what you're seeing on the echo, especially if you find a shockable rhythm. Um, on uh, this side you can see, um, on the left you can see a, a, a systolic arrest with some spontaneous echo contrast where the blood is stagnating, and on the um, right side of the screen you can see a fibrillating um, muscle. So un uncovering a shockable rhythm that otherwise was not apparent can really change the diagnosis in this patient and obviously the downstream management as well. Um, if you look at the um, disting distinguishing pseudo-PEA from PEA. So if your patient looks like they're a PEA but they have heart contractility is normal, that could be a function of a vasculopath having no pulse. 
compared to on the right side, you can see a true PEA um, echo where you can see pulseless electrical activity, uh, but no myocardial contractility per se. And this is the famous paper from 1996 resuscitation that actually showed the discordance of um, pulselessness um, and actual presence of cardiac arrest. Um, so the phenomena is not quite clear how prevalent it is, but all of us who have been around uh, long enough, uh, every now and then a patient does come where this disconnect can really help because um, when you're guiding the treatment to a PE arrest versus just refractory shock, just severe shock that patient just doesn't happen to have a pulse that you can't detect, the management obviously becomes pretty different. Um, the biggest use where um, ultrasound can be extremely helpful if done properly and without delaying CPR is finding a treatable etiology. Uh, in this particular case, on the right side, you can see a pretty collapsed IVC, um, inferior vena cava next to the um, uh, beating heart. And on the left side, you can see that there is an external compression of the left atrium. Um, in this particular case, um, you can see left atrium is not getting enough filling, and that is leading to a hypovolemic shock picture, probably from a focal tamponade phenomena. And this is a, more of a surgical lesion than anything else. Um, and this is a patient that probably needs very emergent um, directed therapy to treat the cause of shock. Um, the classical case that we obviously see in uh, medical um, settings is a patient that has a sudden cardiac arrest in the settings of a critical illness, and PE becomes one of the big differential diagnoses. And on the left, you can see a uh, apical four-chamber view where the chambers of the heart, right and left, are almost the same size. And on the right, you can see the comparison to a normal four, um, apical four-chamber view. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, in this particular case, in the right atrium, you can actually see physically the pulmonary embolism traveling. So having this diagnosis at hand in the emergent um, settings can really help your PERT team or your pulmonary embolism rapid response team make decisions of thromb thrombolysis or thrombectomy and can be life-changing for that particular patient depending upon the other comorbidities. The caution I would exercise here is now there is emerging literature with significant data from transesophageal echocardiography that isolated RV dilatation in the settings of cardiac arrest should not be used as a sign of PE. There is emerging evidence that because of the way the pressure gradients change, um, RV dilatation is a phenomena that occurs physiologically um, uh, in these patients way more often, even in the absence of PE. So you um, uh, need to be a little more cautious about um, uh, signs of RV strain, actually physically looking at the PE and even adding other point of care um, um, devices like um, DVT diagnoses to uh, if time and urgency allows uh, to make a diagnosis um, based on uh, ultrasound. The other things you can find is some treatable causes like an acute MI. So this is a patient that uh, apparently had a um, cardio, uh, cardiac bypass surgery and had a pretty uneventful perioperative event, um, perioperative course, um, got extubated, and then on day two suffered a cardiac arrest um, in the hospital. And um, on the right, you can see a normal apical four chamber with very nice vertical up and down movement of the RV. And on the left side, you can see the RV is barely contracting, although LV is fine. So in this particular case, the cause of shock is not LV hypocontractility, tamponade, or something else. It's complete RV failure in this particular case, and this was an otherwise healthy person with a, um, a genetic cause for um, their um, a coronary disease that led to coronary artery bypass. And the diagnosis was made of acute right RCA infarct um, with EKG as well. And obviously, if he had waited for troponins, it would have taken some time. But I, um, knowing the patient's pre-op, uh, normal echo and knowing the um, uh, regional wall motion abnormalities associated with RV infarct, the patient was able to go to the cath lab and RCA dissection was found that was um, uh, found to be the cause. Other treatable etiologies like um, tamponade, um, these are the kind of cases where you can code them, you know, till the cows come home, but until you really re relieve the cause of cardiac arrest, which is tamponade in this particular case, you really don't have a fair chance of helping the patient. In this particular case, on the left side, you see apical four-chamber view where you can see the right atrium collapse during the systole. And on the, um, left si on, the, on the left side of the screen and on the right side of the screen, you can see the subcostal view of a heart that's really struggling to maintain any end diastolic volume. And you can see the RV um, diastolic collapse. So this is a patient that um, had about 800 ml of uh, pericardial effusion that was emergently um, um, drained. Um, and uh, uh, that resulted in uh, patient's hemodynamics uh, uh, getting um, stabilized before he was taken for um, um, surgery again to find the cause of the pericardial, um, pericardial effusion that caused the tamponade. 
Um, if the subcostal views are hard, which can be sometimes hard in these patients, um, uh, IVC has been used as a surrogate as well. So on the left, you can see a, a plethoric IVC compared to the right, where you have a pretty collapsible IVC. Again, these can be indirect signs. And isolation, they may not mean anything, but understanding the clinical context, even having um, one image that supports that diagnosis can be extremely helpful in directing um, your attention to the cause of the therapy. The other uh, often treatable cause is a tension pneumothorax causing cardiac arrest, um, especially if the patient had relative history of a procedural complication that could have re resulted in a pneumothorax. And, and decompressing that obviously can um, stabilize the patient's hemodynamics, and you see a lung point in this particular case. Um, this is a case that um, kind of made me a believer uh, of um, having a focus as a big tool in cardiac arrest. So this was a post, um, it's a stroke patient, um, cardio, cardiovascular hemodynamics is pretty stable. Patient goes for a trach and peg, has been in the hospital for quite some time, comes back, I get a sign out, uneventful course. Um, it's a percutaneous peg, and the patient arrives in anesthesia, says that he's been on about 20 of neosinephrine, um, and as I'm evaluating the patient, um, the patient rapidly deteriorates and goes into cardiac arrest. And um, um, obviously, you know, ultrasound is by bedside in a few minutes. And um, the heart is pretty normal um, for this patient who's been here for quite some time. There is some dyskinesis associated with his cardiovascular comorbidities, but nothing that explains his uh, sudden cardiac arrest and shock. And um, uh, the anesthesia says it was an eventful course. EGS, emergency general surgery, says it was an uneventful course. But as I do their quick fast exam, you can see on the right side, uh, next to the liver and the kidney, you see d decent amount of fluid. And on the left side with spleen, and obviously pick up the phone, call the EGS, and say, you know, I'm seeing free fluid in the abdomen. And the patient had a mental artery um, rupture as, um, as a part of the um, gastrostomy procedure that uh, led to x -lap, and we didn't waste time getting a CT scan in this patient. So this made me a believer that even as a neurologist, I need to be um, doing fast exams um, as a part of my resuscitation focus. Now, although these seem like very intuitive and physiologically sound indications of focus, um, you have to ex exercise caution. As of today, the best evidence to CPR resuscitation is to delay um, not to cause any delay in CPR, um, not to uh, have the pulse checks cause any delay in CPR, and make sure that the patient gets defibrillated in time for shockable rhythms and not adrenaline in time for non-shockable rhythms. So transthoracic images have had concerns um, of delaying, prolonging pulse check duration. Um, and in general, the guidance is that the most experienced operator should per be performing these scans, and uh, only one sonographic window should be done. And in the last slides, I will show you um, the, um, this is the um, few articles that have kind of raised issue over that concern, that incorporating a po focus uh, in an inexperienced way without a pro protocolized way can cause um, delays. Reason trial was the big one um, that everybody cites with the largest number of patients reported so far. Every other trial has been about 100 to 200 patients. Um, and it also raised concern about one uh, common misconception that if you see cardiac standstill on echo, you can call off the code. Um, in their study, 11% of the patients where the cardiac standstill was seen despite uh, echo, um, and they continued resuscitation. These patients actually did survive to hospital discharge. So ultrasound has to be taken in context um, with its limitations as well. So um, uh, although AHA recommendations do um, suggest that POCUS can be incorporated, probably when um, um, your usefulness um, um, is not uh, prohibited by the delay um, in pulse check, and the most experienced provider should be doing it. Um, this is the, um, uh, the European Resuscitation Council recommendations that also uh, put some caution on the use of POCUS, although they do think that to some extent it could have a significant role in finding treatable causes, but exercise caution both, both on the right ventricular issue as well as the fact that it should not prolong interruptions. Sir, can you hear me? This patient's not responding. I can't feel a carotid pulse. He's got a neurosinus complex rhythm. Start chest compressions, Will. Definitely. Caitlin, can you grab an AED and a code cart and call for help? And uh, Paige, will you assist with the airway? Looks like we're in uh, the PEA algorithm. So Mandy, can you grab an um, echo? Got a milligram of epi? Yeah, let's give a milligram of epi IV. What cycle is this? This is the fifth cycle. Okay. Let's start with the echo. Milligram of epi then. Thank you. So in 10 seconds, we're going to do a rhythm and a pulse check, and along with that, a feel exam. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 
One, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We'll resume chest compressions. There are no pulses. Okay, it looks like the, there's no pericardial effusion. The RV's functioning well, but he's grossly underfilled. He's hypovolemic. Caitlin, can you get a bag of... So you can see in this particular case how, in a very protocolized fashion, um, chest compressions were not inhibited, and during the pulse check, uh, the uh, physician made sure um, that uh, uh, there was no delay in CPR, and the attempt at getting the windows were done during the actual CPR, so the window is optimized by the time it's time for pulse check, and the 10 seconds of pulse check were actually used um, to record the image, and the next two minutes were used to um, analyze this image, um, and the person performing the ultrasound was detached from the person uh, that was leading the resuscitation. So lots of protocols have been suggested recently um, that can um, <clears throat> give you guidance on how to record, but the gist of that is that you should use the CPR time to optimize your window, most likely subcostal. Uh, you should use the pulse check to record the window, either in cine or video, and then you, you should use the second follow-up uh, two-minute CPR to actually analyze those images and, um, and make any recommendations. This is the one protocol from ACEP. Um, the future of ultrasound, um, there is more research now going on in use of TEE, especially from the perspective of effectiveness of CPR and the exact location, so it does not cause LVOT obstruction itself. Uh, people are looking at um, doing other point of care modalities in resuscitation as well, but we definitely need more research, but my hope is that um, in a protocolized fashion, especially in the right context um, where it does not delay CPR, you will consider um, using ultrasound as a part of your resuscitation. Thank you. Arty, thank you. There were some compelling images. Are there any questions from the audience? It's extraordinarily difficult for us to see. We've got very bright lights in our eyes, so <laughs> we'll rely on uh, our colleague with the microphone there to bring it to you if you've got a question. Can I, can I ask you a question? Uh, please excuse me my, my ignorance, but um, in the post-resuscitation period, um, when you do all your pharmacological interventions, are you using ultrasound to monitor potential treatment effects, and are there any criteria to maybe quantify or the, your treatment effects? Is, would that be an option as well? I think you just ask a question that opens a Pandora's box. Uh, people are actually looking at that question from different organ um, a target perspective. Uh, from a heart perspective, obviously, you know, cardiogenic shock was a part of the, um, and the etiology that led to the cardiac arrest. It is very intuitive to use cardiac index markers um, and cardiac output markers in the, in the post-resuscitation period to see response to therapy. We have often um, evaluated patients and um, uh, escalated them to need for mechanical circulatory support based on that. Obviously, if it's a device-related failure, you know, ultrasound is a great way to look at that. Uh, people are actually also looking at, um, you must have heard of recent trials with MAP targets. Uh, you know, we say 75 versus 85, what is better? But uh, there's a study in Singapore that is looking at transcranial Doppler ultrasound uh, with perspective of are we optimizing cerebral perfusion um, in the immediate post-cardiac arrest period and titrating rest of the systemic hemodynamic management to optimize that. Mm. So a lot more research um, needs to be done and lots of efforts are going on. Similar effort in renal failure as well. But ultrasound is just a very ideal physiologically valid tool to study them. So my hope is that more research comes out of it soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. If there's no other questions, thanks very much, Artie. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, well, really needs no introduction, Fabio Tacconi from here in Brussels. Our, our host here in Brussels uh, is going to talk to us about ultrasound in the brain. Fabio. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so brain ultrasound, uh, so you know the concept of monitoring, and uh, as we uh, have some problems in assessing the brain clinically, because in, is it in the skull, we need, of course, to combine different monitoring tools to better understand what's going on in our patients, in particular for those suffering from an acute brain injury. So if you have an ultrasound, which is the case in most of the ICU, you can try to estimate brain perfusion, try to estimate elevated intracranial pressure, and if you're very good, you try also to look whether there are brain abnormalities. So I try to set up five steps with increasing level of uh, skills acquisition that ICU physician might have to use brain ultrasound in the ICU. The first one is that just using transcranial coral Doppler, 
you can easily identify the brainstem here. So here you have the Willis polygon, and when you put the color, you will have this kind of image, which show you, for example, the middle cerebral artery, which is the main artery in one hemisphere, bringing around 75% of blood flow. And so you can use your, your uh, Doppler to set up a specific uh, place into the MCE and then measure uh, velocities. So this is what you obtain in terms of information and from this pattern, which is the typical pattern, normal pattern, when you're measuring a velocity in MCA, you can try to estimate whether there are some problems into the brain that will impede normal perfusion. So why with using Doppler this is possible? Again, it's purely based on the, on the ultrasound concept. The systolic velocity is proportional to the entry of the blood into the skull, and the diastolic velocity is proportional to cerebral vascular resistances. Of course, there might be constriction of arterials, for example, due to hyperventilation or hypocapnia. But in patients with an acute brain injury, if you have an increased resistance, this is generally due to a problem of elevated ICP. And this is, again, a case published from the Grenoble group, showing the patients here with a normal Doppler, showing signs of neuro worsening. They repeat the Doppler, and you see a reduction of the solic velocity an increase of this index, which is automatically calculated by the device, called the pulsatility index, a ratio between systolic minus diastolic divided by mean, and a decrease of diastolic velocity or an increase of pulsatility index is proportionally uh, uh, associated with a decrease in perfusion. Of course, this image can be seen also when you have a huge alteration of perfusion, for example, as we observe in patients with brain death. Clinical application, if you have a patient arrive at the hospital with mild to moderate TBI, you might use a Doppler to quite nicely discriminate those patients who will develop secondary neuro worsening. So it might be used Doppler and admission in mild to moderate TBI as a triage system for the patients who require more attention and monitoring than others. And for patients who have an ICP monitor, you can also again use Doppler, combine Doppler velocities with the a measure of mean arterial pressure using this, um, this uh, formula here, and then you can estimate directly a value that gives you an estimated ICP. Does it work? In that paper, you can reasonably exclude elevated ICP when ICP estimated by Doppler is below 20 millimeters of mercury. And of course, as I told you before, in the clear situation where there is a huge impairment in brain perfusion, as it's been observed in patients ongoing to brain death, the absence or these pathological patterns of Doppler measured at the four main vessels into the brain, two MCA, two vertebral arteries, has 100% specificity to diagnose brain death in these patients. Importantly, even though measuring MCA velocities is very interesting to assess alteration of perfusion, this is not a surrogate of ICP. You cannot replace ICP with Doppler. Doppler gives you a signal of alert that something is going on, but if you want to measure ICP precisely, you need still an ICP catheter. This is very easy. The level two of assessment of a brain ultrasound is when you want to assess the occurrence of brain cerebral vasospasm in patients suffering from a subarachnoid hemorrhage, not going too into details. When you have a narrowing of the vessels on the right part of the slides, you have an increase of the velocity in the measured vessels. This, again, can be measured at several levels. You can, of course, evaluate the absolute velocity into these patients. And again, repeated measurements are very important to understand how this increase evolves over time. And you can, of course, uh, compare the velocities of the artery in the brain to the artery that is giving the blood to the brain, for example, the carotid artery, and then calculate the ratio, which is the ratio of the MCA velocities on the carotid velocities, also called the Lindegard ratio, which is very much used in this setting. The main important message for the use of brain ultrasound to detect cerebral vasospasm is summarized in the systematic review, which has not so much changed over the last year. The main message is if you have a patients who have a clinical signs of neuro worsening that are compatible with brain vas cerebral vasospasm and you have a, a pathological findings from a ultrasound, then the predictive, uh, positive predictive value of ultrasound is extremely high. While if you have a patient who is clinically deteriorating but your cerebral ultrasound doesn't show alteration of MCA velocities, of intracranial vessel velocities, you cannot exclude vasospasm just based on the, on the ultrasound uh, information. So it's a very good tool here, not to exclude ICP as before, but to confirm vasospasm in those patients with clinical neurodeterioration. 
And again, to measure level one, two hours of training is very easy to perform and MCA velocity is most of the patients. While if you want to uh, get level two, which is measurement of velocity in different arteries into the skull, that requires, of course, much more training. This is, of course, a level three. You can use a brain ultrasound to assess the optic nerve sheet diameter, which is, again, a surrogate of alteration of CSF outflow that is proportionally associated with the potential increase of intracranial hypertension. So if you measure uh, this uh, ONSD using brain ultrasound and you correlate with ICP, there is, again, a nice mathematical correlation. Again, as usually it happens, you see the variability of the measurement. I have a 15 ICP with a perfectly normal ONSD or clearly pathologic ONSD. So again, this is a triage system that does not replace entirely ICP. And there are many studies showing that if you have a cutoff, let's say around six millimeters, considering the normal NSD is around four millimeters in adult, you can reasonably predict elevated ICP in severe acute brain injury, primarily traumatic brain injury, who are unconscious arriving at the hospital. The point with this approach is that to learn properly to assess ONSD requires much more training than just measuring MCA velocities. It requires probably months of training because there are many papers coming from the ophthalmology field where you have a lot of false assessment of NSD just because of the presence of the vessels coming from the retina towards the skull. There is a level four assessment or brain ultrasound, which is brain morphology. And this really requires two things. The first one, you need an appropriate window into the skull. So patients who have a very thick skull, well, the morphology is not possible to be analyzed. And the second, of course, to have a very good training because you need to repeatedly do it and, if possible, compare what you measure to the uh, brain CT scan, which is, of course, the gold standard. So if you see this image, and again, the pointer is not working so well, you see these two lines indicated by the white arrow. This is the third ventricle. And this is the image, again, comparing what you can observe on the CT scan and on the right side, what you would observe using brain ultrasound. Of course, again, this is the, per the patient who would a very good acoustic window when the probe is placed at the left of the temporal bone. Now, does it work? Yes, it's okay to assess the third ventricle. It's a reliable technique, again, in skilled hands to predict the needs of a cerebral spinal fluid drainage. And for example, if you look at the measurement of the third ventricle and you use a 5.5 millimeters as a cutoff, this is a very good way to predict those patients who might be uh, withdrawn from uh, an EVD catheter, the catheter that we use to withdraw CSF, because you have stopped draining, you see that the ventricle is not increasing as a size, so you can reliably remove the EVD without performing an additional CT scan, so reducing the exposure to the patients to additional radiation. Of course, what is uh, mainly used in practice is that if you have a good window, you can then start to calculate the distance from the two different parts of the skull compared to the third ventricle, which is, again, an, an indirect measurement, an indirect measurement of what we call in clinical practice the midline shift. Having a midline shift suggesting an alteration in brain compliance, typically observed with focal lesion, that is preceding the herniation, which is, of course, a complication we want to avoid in our patients. Does it work? Well, if you measure the midline shift using ultrasound, and you compare this measurement performed on CT scan, which is the gold standard by a blinded radiologist, this correlates quite pretty well. And of course, on the right part of the arrow, you can see also patients with a craniectomy. So if you have a craniectomy with a very nice uh, window because they have no more skull, so they can very easily assess the morphology of the brain, then the performance of the ultrasound is even more accurate. Of course, if you have a very good and the window is very nice, you can try to see this kind of image. It's a subdural hematoma on the left side. and the right side of the window, you can see an increase of the size of the subdural hematoma. In those patients where, again, the, the operator is very much trained and there is a very good acoustic window, the accuracy of the ultrasound to re reliably assess the size of uh, subdural hematoma of intracranial hemorrhage is around 70 to 90%. There is a fifth level that I just want to mention. This is the level that very few people have, which is using continuous assessment of uh, MC velocity as a surrogate of CBF and correlate the changes of CBF velocity with changes in one of the 
determinant of a CBF, which is mean arterial pressure, and you use a high frequency signal to be decomposed and create this kind of measurement, which is a statistical approach to look how changing CBF velocities are associated or not to change the mean arterial pressure to evaluate autoregulation. In terms of a concept, it's very easy to understand. If a velocity change proportionally to change in mean arterial pressure, this means that the flow is pressure dependent, so autoregulation is impaired. If change in velocities are independent of mean arterial pressure, this means that the flow is pressure independent, so potentially this is autoregulating properly. And you can easily, I mean, if you have the dedicated software and the, and the good um, uh, um, the good material, you can calculate this kind of curve uh, that uh, depicts uh, a NATO regulatory plateau, which is probably smaller than what we expect, where the flow is independent from mean arterial pressure. In some studies, you can actively calculate an optimal perfusion pressure at which there are less risks that <coughs> the brain is exposed to hypoperfusion. So we have seen that you can do at least five different things using brain ultrasound with five different levels of training and skills. And just to conclude, this is my last slide. This is what we have written in this recent consensus paper using ultrasound in general, from the brain to the two in uh, ICU patients. You see that measuring MC velocity as a triage for potential suspicion of intracranial hypertension, this is recommended. It's very easy to be trained to measure MC velocities at the bedside. Of course, it's a very easy measurement, but there are a lot of caveats. You need to understand what you are measuring. All the other pot potential utilities, like determination of brain death, cerebral vasospasm, they are feasible, but they require training. So they are open for people who work, for example, in neuro ICU or usually treat uh, acute brain injury patients, <coughs> but it's po po probably beyond the training of the you know, ICU physician working in the mixed ICU. And as cerebral autoregulation is very interesting, but very complicated to measure because of the skills and the software needed, this remains, I mean, non uh, required in the common practice, just at the moment as a research tool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tacone, for um, offering and showing us the, the spectrum of application of uh, ultrasound uh, uh, for the brain on brain monitoring. Are there any questions from the floor? Oh, yeah. Could we have a microphone, please, to the right side? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Tacona, for uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Elbers from uh, from Amsterdam. I don't think I'll have level five, but uh, maybe we can work on that. I was just wondering, are there any issues about uh, the heating of the of the brain related to ultrasound, and 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 if so, is that also a clinical problem? It's a very good question because um, I didn't uh, mention that for brain ultrasound using, for example, MC velocity, you're working with around 2.5 megahertz. So that's not a big issue. <clears throat> but if you work, for example, on ONSD, uh, you are around 9, sometimes 12 megahertz. So the exposure of ultrasound to a very delicate part of the body with the potentially for a prolonged period might be an issue. So when you discuss with ophthalmologists, they say they usually use in different kinds of diseases for the retina and for a measurement that takes, you know, 30 seconds doesn't does make really a problem. But, but so this is what I know. For brain ultrasound using just MCA velocities, there's not a big issue. And then, of course, if you consider that we have measured, you know, some centers, it's a continuous Doppler measurement for hours and hours, at least there's not been uh, uh, reported as, uh, as a potential uh, concern. Michael, you? Yeah, so, no question if there's none, uh, no others from the audience. You, you've highlighted the training burden for some of the more complicated ways of scanning. Uh, one of the major themes of the conference has been artificial intelligence. Are you aware of any devices, even just in development, uh, that use artificial intelligence to sort of know what they're looking at uh, to be able to take that training burden away? So what I'm aware of are uh, devices today that are able to automatically identify the vessel. This is in particular true for continuous 
MC velocity. In general, it depends a lot on the operator. You have to look at it blindly, so it takes time. It's very time consuming. There are a few devices now present on the market that can automatically identify the vessels, so set up the presence of the flow and set up the depth and adjust themselves, in particular when you move the patients, you can lose the signal. So it's very nice in terms of research tool to provide continuous MCA velocities, for example. Of course, again, it depends a lot on what you're asking to the device, because continuous MCA velocity is already beyond the level one. Level one is point of care, one measurement to have a triage system. Continuous measurement is very important for auto regulation, for example. Uh, and of course, there is also the problem with the, you know, the, the size of the device. So if you use this kind of device and you want to apply something else, it becomes a little bit complicated. In terms of analysis of the signal, as far as I know, there are software analyzing the correlation, of course, automatically, flow velocity with mean arterial pressure, giving you a, an interpretation of the signal, meaning this is elevated ICP. As far as I know, this is not the case. It still reminds in the hands of the operator. Uh, please, please allow uh, one more practical question. Um, moving a TBI patient within the hospital around, like from the ICU to the CT scanner and back, puts always the patient at a certain risk. Um, under which circumstances would you consider using brain ultrasound to replace a, a, a CT follow-up in brain-injured patients, for example? just reducing the risk of in-hospital transfers? Uh, this is a very good question because, of course, having normal MC velocity might say I cannot do a CT scan. The, again, the problem is more is independent from ultrasound. Why do you do a CT scan? That's my question. Many people do a CT scan every two days, expecting the radiation will cure the brain, which is not the case. So if there is a clinical reason why you go for the CT scan, well, of course, you have to do it independently from the, what the brain ultrasound will tell you. Brain ultrasound can give you more information as I showed you, for example, to, re to withdraw EVD. But these are more situations where the patient is stabilized. In the very early phase, when you know ICP can spike and uh, brain edema or herniation can be a problem, we still rely a lot of imaging because it gives you also an information what's going on, why ICP is elevated. So I think we need more research before saying let's don't do the CT scan or do it, so make a clinical decision. We need more data, robust data, to suggest that this information is really relevant in terms of decision making, which is again partially demonstrating what we have in the literature. Okay, thank you so much thank for you. this uh, elaborate um, explanation. So we move on, um, going again to the heart, and the next presentation will be by Antoine Veillard-Baron from uh, Boulogne in France. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, so in this presentation, I, I will not cover at all or almost at all the impact and the outcome of uh, doing a critical care echo. You will, uh, there is an ongoing uh, ESICM guidelines. Just during a long time, uh, uh, a critical care echo was uh, uh, understood as an alternative to the Swangans catheter and to uh, uh, finally uh, invasive uh, hemodynamic monitoring. Indeed, as you know, you may measure the cardiac output, you may evaluate the PAOP, you may evaluate the right atrial pressure, you may uh, measure the pulmonary artery pressure, systolic or mean pulmonary artery pressure. However, we know that uh, this is much more than that. And if you look at this uh, old uh, consensus paper uh, when we met uh, in Roma with Jean-Louis Vincent, you have here the key properties of an ideal hemodynamic monitoring system. And I just want to emphasize that uh, finally, if you look at carefully, critical care echocardiography uh, meets uh, most of them. Probably, uh, of course, it's not operator independent and we do not, we do not have any uh, information about the cost effectiveness. But something that is really key for me is that critical care echo should provide information that is able to guide therapy. And this is something that we do each day uh, in our usual practice. Look at this very, uh, let's say, old uh, retrospective analysis. Uh, many uh, uh, patients, because more than 2,500 TE procedures in critically ill patients. 
Just want to show you uh, the indication of the T procedure uh, in this uh, uh, series. And if you look at carefully, it was almost in half of cases for hemodynamic reason, because either hemodynamic instability or the need to evaluate the cardiac function. Of course, you may uh, look for many other specific cardiological diagnoses using the probe, but it was um, mainly, uh, in many cases, done for a hemodynamic reason. And if you look at the results of the T procedures, uh, this was uh, almost in half of cases related to hemodynamics. With, uh, they uh, uh, found left ventricular uh, uh, dysfunction, they found hypovolemia, and so they uh, had a direct impact on the management of their patients because of a diagnostic impact, a therapeutic impact, and even a surgical impact in case they found a very specific uh, diagnosis uh, pushing the patient into the operating room. I like this study for many reasons. First, because uh, uh, it was conducted by my, by my friend Paul Mayo. Second, because it was conducted in the USA, so which is not so uh, frequent to have papers coming from the USA and using a TEE. Third, because uh, uh, they uh, demonstrated that uh, when uh, done by uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine fellows, nothing really happens. It was very safe. And finally, uh, because uh, we have uh, in this paper the reason why uh, they decided to do a TEE, most of the time because uh, the, uh, they had inadequate views by a transthoracic approach. But in some cases, because they wanted to look for specific diagnosis as endocarditis, and in a few cases, as discussed uh, during the previous lecture, during active CPR or immediately after ROSC, to have more information uh, to better manage the patient. And look at what they found in terms of, uh, 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 let's say, findings. Uh, mostly, once again, they, they report uh, hemodynamic uh, interesting information. Many patients uh, exhibited acute corpulmonale. I have to say that uh, all of these patients were invasively uh, mechanically ventilated. Many patients had left ventricular uh, dysfunction and some patients had a dynamic obstruction of the LV outflow track or hyperdynamic pattern of the left ventricle. So very key information to manage uh, our patients. And what they did based on the T procedure, that's really interesting because in a few cases only, they decided to apply something directly related to hemodynamics to more fill the patient, to add the butamine. But look at in most of cases, they decided to better adapt the respiratory settings in their patients. So it just illustrates the fact that when you use the, the, the critical care echo, at the end, you may change the respiratory strategy and hear the respiratory settings. That's definitively uh, the device that you use matters. You do not apply the same treatment according to the hemodynamic device you use to monitor your patient. Look at this study, uh, 127 patients admitted in the ICU for septic shock. And here they comparated the agreement between the transthoracic echo in their patients and the transpulmonary thermodilution, something uh, that is uh, used in many uh, ICUs, especially in Europe. And look at, at the bedside, when it was interpreted at the bedside by the frontline physician in charge of the patient, the agreement was moderate. So many discrepancies between both approaches, so probably different uh, management and different treatment adaptation. The second uh, uh, study, which will illustrate the fact that definitively the device you use matters, is the one we uh, published many years ago in 46 patients, once again admitted for septic shock. And uh, we wanted to compare two different approaches. The first one based on the first version of the uh, surviving sepsis campaign guideline, so mostly based on the CVP, the mean natural pressure, and the SCVO2 to decide giving more fluids, uh, increasing norepinephrine, or adding uh, inotropic support. Or another approach, which was our approach, based on the T evaluation on the hemodynamics, mostly based on the respiratory variation of the supervena cava, a parameter of LV systolic function. Just to show you the result, once again, a huge discrepancies between both approaches. 
For instance, uh, regarding fluids requirement, the surviving sepsis compiled said yes in 14 patients, while the TEE said no. Regarding the inotropic drug uh, requirement, the surviving sepsis campaign said in 11 patients no, while the TE uh, said in the same patient yes. Of course, this is by definition always related to the clinical situation of the patient. So this is why I think finally, after many versions, the last one of the surviving sepsis campaign you can here see that uh, they suggest uh, adding the butamine in patients with septic shock when there is persistent hyperperfusion despite adequate initial resuscitation. But, and this is really crucial to have this in mind, you need to evaluate the cardiac function and especially to look for a cardiac dysfunction before deciding to do that. And this is probably to avoid this kind of uh, uh, trial, well, very well designed, but the crazy uh, randomized controlled trial, including patients, uh, adult patients with septic shock, under vasopressor infusion uh, uh, since uh, uh, more than four hours, and just randomized into two groups, a levosimodon group and the control group. And absolutely no characterization of the cardiac function and especially the, syst the LV systolic function. And as you know what they found, they found a trend uh, for an increase in the average so far during the ICU stay in the levosimonon group. And they also found a trend for decreased survival in the levosimonon group compared to the usual care. So it's a very good demonstration that you, you need to characterize how is the cardiac function. And maybe in the future, and here it's a pilot study, so very preliminary, uh, the future is to combine, of course, this is our usual practice, uh, parameters of critical care echo with clinical parameters, biological parameters, giving you information, a better information about perfusion, adequacy of perfusion. And this is what we try to do here in a large cohort of 360 patients, all invasively mechanically ventilated and admitted for septic shock. You can see that we did not put into the machine too many variables, mostly echo parameters and some clinical uh, parameters as the blood pressure, the dose of norepinephrine, for instance. But I think in the future, we could put much more into the machine. Look at, it's fascinating that the, the machine is able to uh, differentiate patients in different phenotypes, which makes physiologically sense. In 17% of cases, we could consider that patient was adequately resuscitated. It's not uh, a disappointing, this is a very good result when you do critical care echo to say, okay, my treatment is optimized. LV systolic dysfunction in 18%, hyperkinesia in 23%, probably patients still profoundly vasoplegic, RV failure in 22% of cases, and still hypovolemic in 19%. Look at very quickly here, LV systolic dysfunction. This is TEE, the LV is not working very well and the LV filling pressure is not elevated. RV failure, it's obvious that the right ventricle is severely dilated, completely compressing the left ventricle. Hypovolemia, you have collapse of the supervena cava and you have a preserved LV systolic function. Or finally, profound, uh, uh, significant hyperkinesia in this patient after optimization of fluids, so vasoplegic status. You may have a very uh, simple approach also to manage fluids using uh, a critical care echo, either by a transthoracic approach or a transesophageal one. And very simple message, first, do, do not feel. Do not feel if you look at that the RV is severely dilated. Do, lo do not feel if you look at that the IVC is dilated probably above 25 to 27 millimeters. Do not feel if you find elevation of LV filling pressure and do not feel if there is severe, severe valvulopathy. Feel, according of course to the uh, clinical uh, situation, if you have a kissing left ventricle, plus minus a dynamic obstruction, if you have a very small IVC, if you have collapsibility of the supervena cava in invasively uh, ventilated patient. And optional, you may try, we don't know, if you have only mild SVC respiratory variations, 
if you have some respiratory variation of the maximal velocity of the aortic flow, or if you do a passive leg rising and you consider that the patient could be fluid responder. Just a few words regarding the different skills you need to achieve for applying such an approach. Could be summarized as a pyramid. You have the base of the pyramid for a very basic and focused approach that could be also uh, called POCUS. So you need to detect very obvious abnormalities. Very small IVC, very dilated IVC, very poor contractile LV, very big RV, and so on. You have another level, which is the advanced uh, level. Uh, here, you need uh, not only to be able to perform transthoracic echo, but also to perform transesophageal echo. Because here now, we ask you to really monitor the hemodynamics using the device. And so this is a much more integrated <coughs> approach based partially on the heart-lung interaction. And of course, at the top, you have the expert level. Few words regarding the, the, the training. In a different, with different experts for the basic uh, uh, level, we consider that 10 hour course is enough with 30 fully supervised transthoracic echo at the bedside. No certification is needed because it should be included into the curriculum of all the intensivists now in 2024. This is the, the, the uh, guidelines that uh, Fabio uh, spoke about. We also, in these uh, guidelines, uh, uh, add some statements regarding the heart. And I just don't want to describe all these statements. You will go through the paper. But just in red, we just say that for basic people, basic skills, do not use a critical care echo to predict the response to fluids. It's not the adequate approach. You want just to, de to detect gross abnormality, so obvious hypovolemia, or volemia, uh, okay. For the advanced critical care echoes, it's completely different. We consider uh, 40 hours courses, 100 supervisor transthoracic echo, 30 supervisor TEE, and it requires definitively uh, certification. And this is exactly why with others in 2015, we created the EDEC, Europea, European Diploma in Advanced Critical Care Echo, under the supervision of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. And I think that it is uh, well attended and could uh, allow you to achieve the uh, adequate skills to adequately use uh, this technique uh, for your patient. I just finished with this slide, and this is my only slide regarding the potential relationship between critical care echo and the outcome. To, to tell you that maybe in the future we will have a partial response. Maybe you hear about this uh, randomized control trial ongoing, which is the Andromeda Shock 2 uh, trial, just to show you that uh, after the first uh, uh, initial part of the protocol, which is mostly uh, dedicated to optimization of volemia and fluids requirement, and most of the things are based on the capillary refill time, the second part of the protocol is mostly based on an evaluation of cardiac function using either transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography to look for any cardiac issues that could be corrected uh, uh, by different treatments. And so more than uh, 1,000 patients are already included. And I think that maybe in a year or two years, we will have some uh, interesting results with this approach. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Antoine, thank you again for a very comprehensive uh, talk. Are there any questions? So perhaps I, I have one. Um, it's always struck me as a little incongruous that we think of transthoracic echocardiography as the simple one and transesophageal as more complicated because, of course, the images are more simple to get and uh, and, and perhaps even interpret uh, from a transesophageal echo. And I think the reason for that is, of course, just the, the risk and, and, and so on in, in inserting the probe. We've heard for many years that the probes were going to get smaller and we might even find ourselves with probes that could be left in situ for, for, for many hours, maybe even days, as a continuous monitoring device. Do you see that on the horizon? Do you think that might change, change the way we approach things? 
So, so first part of your question, you are completely right. Uh, usually, uh, intensivists, they consider that the transthoracic echo is easier than the TEE, while actually this is exactly the opposite. Uh, this is mostly due to the fact that they are a little bit afraid to use this uh, big probe inside the patient, but this is much lower operator dependent, much easier to obtain the adequate views, and finally to interpret the, the exam. So definitively, and this is my experience uh, in my unit, this is much easier to train our fellows for TEE hemodynamic evaluation than for transthoracic echo. For the second part of your question, you're right. There, there, there is or there was a company uh, which developed a, a small TE probe with limited capability, only 2D and color Doppler, no pulsed wave Doppler and no time motion uh, study that, could, that you, ha you could leave in place during 72 hours uh, inside the patient, and this is single use. So after that, you need to use another one if you want to uh, evaluate another patient. That's difficult to understand for me what, what is exactly the room of this new approach. I am not 100% convinced that we should compare that to classical critical care echo because we can do much better with big echo machine. But the ad potential advantage is that this is less discontinuous than the critical care echo, which is definitively con completely discontinuous. So it could be something else uh, uh, something uh, uh, maybe to plug on the monitor, but at that time it doesn't exist. Just allowing intensivists very simply when coming into the room to have a look on the LV size, the LV contraction, the RV size, some <coughs> respiratory variation of the super of an ACAVA. So it's mm -hmm. possible with this technique. The second limitation maybe is the price, which is not nothing. I think it's uh, 600 something like that dollars, the small T probe. And as it is a single use, and as we don't know exactly in which patient we should insert this uh, probe, for now, I don't know. Um, I, may, I, may I just follow up on this? Because I really like the, 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 the idea of continuous um, recordings and, and monitoring, because we have known that, uh, that uh, heart rate variability is, is a very important parameter in predicting sepsis or um, being you know, ahead of the time. And this might also, are you aware of any, any, any ideas in that direction using continuous monitoring to, let's say, to early identify patients at, at, at extreme risk in developing a septic trajectory maybe within the next six, 12 hours? So, so first, I think, uh, if you look at the, the usual uh, hemodynamic uh, devices, mm -hmm. I think it's not a good idea to to fight uh, between, mm -hmm. because finally there is no true continuous monitoring uh, uh, device. Mm -hmm. Either you need to recalibrate, or you are not always in the, in the room, so you need to, to go back in the room to look at how is the PAOP, or to inject a, a cold solution to have the cardiac output, so it's not continuous. Mm -hmm. to, to answer to your question, uh, um, Regarding non-ultrasonography uh, approach, there are some, uh, let's say, indeed, uh, solutions uh, uh, based on the uh, blood pressure signal that could predict, for instance, the fact that in 5 or 10 or 15 minutes, the patient will develop hypotension and hypoperfusion. We know that. It's not very new, but not very well uh, applied uh, right now. Regarding the ultrasound, you have something coming from the Australia, I think, a probe that you can fix on the chest and that could give you a continuous image. But once again, it's not really continuous because you need to be in front of the screen. And, and second, it's very limited uh, information because it's just, for instance, for the LV systolic function. You do not have any information regarding the fluid responsiveness status, regarding the heart lung interaction mm -hmm. and the right ventricle pushing against, against the ventilator. Mm -hmm. so, Many things to, to do again. So there's a window of opportunity, definitely, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Sorry. There is, there is one, one more question. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, basically, uh, I do 
it was in my ICU daily and daily rounds and uh, the main problem of this using this LVDP evaluation or say VTI variation is the patients who are in atrial fibrillation or having multiple ventricular ectopics. Do you have any specific ideas about how do we uh, monitor these patients? So, so in, in general, uh, when you have patient in atrial fibrillation, which is quite frequent uh, with septic shock, uh, it's not very useful to use any mod as the pulsed wave Doppler because you are in big trouble due to the variability. So usually I prefer to use parameters based on the 2D, which are still accurate. And for instance, typically, if you want to look for a fluid responsiveness and if you use the TEE, uh, the SVC uh, collapsibility index is perfectly adapted even uh, the patient has atrial fibrillation or the inferior vena cava also, of course, by a trans approach. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker uh, and the last in this subsection is uh, Pierre Bouza, who comes to us from Grenoble and is going to talk to us about uh, the abdomen. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, dear Mark, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, so we're going to talk about the use of ultrasonography uh, to explore the abdomen. So if you look at this uh, French observational study we made uh, one day in ICU, you can see that abdominal ultrasound is useful and the fourth role just after echocardiography, lung ultrasonography or TCD. So you can explore the abdomen uh, um, inside the ICU at the bedside with ultrasonography. And we should have basic skill for this. So I remind you the paper that already presented uh, Fabio. This is a consensus paper and we have recommendation as well for the abdomen. So I mentioned here four applications and we we'll not go through all these four applications because we don't have enough time. So I decided to focus my talk on three different topics. The first one is the assessment of uh, kidney and uh, urinary tract. The second one is uh, the assessment of gallbladder. And the third one is the use of FAST in uh, trauma patients. So we not go through aortic syndrome, which is, I think, beyond the scope of uh, the use of uh, ultrasound in the ICU. So regarding kidneys and urinary tract, we have a recommendation here, a strong recommendation that you should be able to insonate the kidney and the bladder in the short and long axis to view the presence of absence of hydronephrosis or bladder over distension. So typically we use a curvilinear probe. We put the probe on the flank, in the flank of the patient on the right side and on the left side. And this is a typical image of a normal kidney in the long axis. As you can see, there is no visualization of a urinary tract here. And here is, in the next slide, a typical example of the beginning of the dilation of the urinary tract. You can see the, the beginning of the dilation of the renal pelvis and the uh, kidney calices. This is the same, the overview of the, in the short axis of the same patients. You can see also the dilation of the urinary tract. And the next uh, patient is also a patient with a more dilated urinary tract. You can see a huge uh, renal pelvis, the huge dilatation of uh, uh, renal calices. Here in uh, long axis, you can also uh, view the dilation of the ureterra. And uh, this is one of the last uh, view. We can see the biggest dilatation of the renal pelvis and the ureter. So this is quite easy. It doesn't give you um, the etiology of the hydronephrosis, but it's quite easy to use at, to, to make at the bedside and in case of you want to uh, see why the patient has acute kidney injury, for example, you can look at the uh, kidney and search for hydronephrosis. What about uh, the use of uh, uh, color uh, Doppler um, and the use of renal Doppler resistive index uh, in patients in the ICU? So the experts were not able to provide any recommendation. And indeed, if you look at the literature, results are very conflicted uh, in terms of uh, prediction of renal failure progression. So they were not able to make recommendation. But in my ICU, we have one, uh, I think, original application that is the use of uh, color Doppler ultrasonography 
uh, after kidney transplantation, and you can uh, follow the, trans the, the perfusion of the kidney. You can also evaluate the quality of the perfusion using resistive index, and you can also visualize the uh, uh, surgical anastomosis. And I think it's very useful at the end of the surgery and when the patient is coming in the ICU to just check if the anastomosis is okay. This is another application for the urinary tract. You can see how you can uh, insulate uh, the bladder in the short and in the long axis. So the, ob the objective is to look for uh, bladder over distension. So we have uh, this uh, nice study uh, published by uh, colleagues from France. Um, you can put the probe just above the pelvis and with an angle of 60 degrees between the anterior wall of the abdomen and the uh, probe and you can measure the greatest transverse diameter and this diameter um, uh, accurately predict um, uh, bladder over distension and if you look at the correlation between the uh, bladder volume assessed by catheterization versus uh, the bladder greatest transverse diameter. You can see that it's a good correlation. And when the diameter is higher than nine centimeters, you can see that the volume uh, is higher than 600, meaning that the patient has bladder over distension. So how can we assess at the best as bladder over distension? So probably you may calculate the volume but you also can uh, look, just look at the largest transverse diameter when it's higher than nine centimeters and the shape, the global shape of the blader may give you an information about the other distension. So this is uh, typical cases on the uh, left uh, side, you can see the patient with other distension and on the right side, this is a, a, a bladder with no over distension. The shape also is really important uh, to um, establish uh, whether the patient has over distension or not. So this is a way we can uh, calculate the volume. I think this is not very useful because only the uh, transverse diameter is useful, but you can, by combining the three uh, different diameters in transverse position, in sagittal position, you can have uh, the estimation of the volume. Regarding the gallbladder, uh, there was no recommendation that we made uh, during this consensus. Uh, so I, I say I, maybe I can stop uh, the exploration of the gallbladder here, but it's more complicated. If you look at the accuracy of uh, emergency physician or intensivist at the bedside uh, compared to uh, radiologists, you can see we're not so bad in determining uh, signs of uh, acute cholecystis. We can see that sensitivity, specificity, positive lactose ratio, negative lactose ratio are not so bad. So I think it could be useful in some patients to know how to insulate the gallbladder. So you can use a curvilinear probe, uh, a subcostal uh, window in a long axis. You also uh, turn the probe to make the short axis and you go from the uh, inside of the patient to the outside part of the patient to insulate in short axis all the gallbladder. So what is the normal gallbladder? Yeah, the gallbladder, the wall is normally less than three millimeters. The content of the gallbladder is hypoalkoic and there is no distension. When you have acu acute alkalculus cholecystite in ICU, major criteria are gallbladder, wall thickening area of three millimeter, a morphe sign during ultrasonography, pericholecystic fluid, and minor signs are gallbladder distension with a long axis area of the 10 centimeters, and sludge visualized inside the gallbladder. This is a, a typical uh, example of patient with acute cholecystite. You can see the, um, the, the uh, enlargement of the uh, uh, gallbladder wall, uh, four millimeters, and you can see the distension of the gallbladder as well. Is it useful in clinical practice? We have one study looking at uh, systematic evaluation of the gallbladder in ICU patient with a, a mean ICU stay of 36 days. You can see that around half of the patient had signs of acute cholecystitis. Most of them did not have acute cholecystitis, but in three uh, patients, they performed surgical life-saving uh, procedure 
in patients with ongoing sepsis and that don't understand where the, 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 the sepsis was and it was uh, linked to the acute cholecystitis. So in some cases, sometimes it may be helpful, but many patients have those signs without having uh, acute cholecystitis. A few words, we have six minutes to go through uh, FAST. So the FAST exam in trauma patients is uh, meant to detect a free fluid in uh, four different acoustic windows in the Morrison Plotch, in, uh, around the heart, uh, around the spleen, and around uh, the bladder. It has an excellent accuracy uh, to detect the fluid. If you look at different meta-analyses, collecting a lot of patients, you can see the sensitivity, specificity is high. So it's very easy to perform, and it's very useful in uh, trauma care. We also have caveats uh, regarding uh, this uh, technique. First, you can have a solid organ injury with almost no liquid free fluid inside the abdomen, but the, the injury of the organ is here. The combination of uh, pelvic trauma is very hard because you can have bladder injury, so it's not blood inside the abdomen, but it's urine. You can also have a, a suffusion from the retroperitoneum, and there is no lesion inside the abdomen, but only a lesion of the uh, pelvic trauma or even in the kidney and a suffusion from the retroperitoneum into the abdomen. And we should also very be cautious with the prehospital use of FAST because you're very close to uh, the injury as sometimes the FAST is negative because there is no uh, um, sufficient amount of liquid to be detected uh, using FAST. I really like this paper, the name is not so fast. They look at 369 patients that do fast and then a CT scan. And uh, they have 22 patients with false negative examination, meaning that this patient had uh, free fluid but were not detected by fast. Six required surgery and 16 had non-operative treatment. If you go into details, if you look at the uh, amount of fluid on CT scan in those patients, you can see that the majority of the patient had less than 300 milliliters into the abdomen. So when you have a, a very small a quantity of fluid in the abdomen, you may not detect uh, uh, this liquid using uh, uh, fast examination. The other point is this is an example of patient in, uh, in my institution in the trauma bay. The um, exploration of the acoustic window should be complete. If you go very fast, you say, okay, this patient does not have any uh, um, fluid in the abdomen, but if you go just a little below, you can see a fluid between the kidney and the liver. So you have to be very careful. You have to be also very careful in determining where the uh, chest begins and where the abdomen begins, so you have to look for the diaphragm. And here is a typical example with pleural effusion and intraabdominal effusion, and sometimes it's hard to make the difference between the two effusion. Is FAST have an impact of, um, regarding the management of tumor patients? So, we performed a study published in 2020, published in the JAMA Open. So we collected uh, observational data in six uh, trauma, lower one trauma centers in France. Here are the patient, the median ISS Y24, it was male patient, uh, usually in, in trauma care. The mortality was uh, pretty low. And we look at the appropriateness of the course of action. So uh, independent assessors, look at the entire records of the, of, the, of the patient and decide whether the uh, use of uh, the clinical exam, the FAST, and uh, the X-ray were appropriate or not in this case. So we found that almost all procedures were appropriate and we find 17 appropriate course of action. It was 13 with protocol deviation and four with erroneous interpretation of eFAST. So it means that Using FAST, you're taking a good decision, and these decisions are mostly appropriate. And if you go into details, we patient had six um, urgent laparotomy before the CT scan, and you can see that the majority of uh, these decisions were taken according to the clinical examination and the FAST. 
So to uh, summarize my talk and to give you some key messages, I would say that basic skills for the abdomen are the kidney and the bladder morphology assessment uh, in, the trauma, in, the, in the ICU. Fast echo in the trauma bay is obviously uh, very important to know and uh, there is real impact on the management of a patient. There is still uncertainty regarding renal Doppler use, regarding the use of gut bladder morphology. And you have to keep in mind that it is POC ultrasonography. So it is ultrasonography in clinical context. We are not radiologists, so we always interpret ultrasound according to our clinical examination or over uh, uh, things like X-ray. And you have just to do it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I really liked your critical remarks about the shortcomings of, of the EFAST, especially the low um, um, sensitivity uh, also documented in several publications and also in the, in the US publication, um, the, the, the high rate of, of, or the relatively high rate of, of uh, false negative results. Um, this obviously relates also to the dynamics within the trauma setting. So do you have a, um, unless you go to the CT scanner, do you have a protocol in place when to repeat the EFAST? Because once the patient, for example, is very hypotensive, um, your EFAST might be negative, and then you fill up the patient with fluid, then it becomes immediately positive. So do you have any, any protocol in place or uh, any, any time window in place when you repeat the, the EFAST? Usually our protocol is to first, usually sometimes the, the first uh, fast is done in the pre-hospital field sometimes because they have uh, echo in the ambulance. Mm -hmm. When they arrive in the trauma bay, so we always make the, the fast examination. And just before leaving the, the, the trauma bay some, to go to the CT scan, we repeat the examination. If we don't understand something because the patient is getting sicker, for instance, mm -hmm. or sh in shock, so we repeat, also repeat the examination. And I agree with you that sometimes we have negative first, including in the pre-hospital fields. It doesn't mean that the physician in the pre-hospital doesn't know how to make fast. It was too early, and so it is not positive fast. And when you repeat the exam, then you see the, uh, the, the, the fluid inside the abdomen. Mm. Yeah. So on the eye level and before leaving to the CT scan mm. for every okay. patient. Okay. Any, any more questions? And thank you, Pierre. Thank, thank you so you. much for this. And in the interest of time, um, <clears throat> we may want to skip the, uh, what's scheduled here as discussion and uh, move right next to the, I think, the, the, the final organ we are talking about uh, this afternoon, that's the lung. And it will be Paul Mayo um, giving us some insights into the use of ultrasound um, on the thorax and the lung tissue. Thank you. It says next here, so I'll press that for the next yeah, because work. I have no disclosures. I'm assuming that most people in the audience, majority already do lung ultrasound. And those who don't, I'm going to convince you to do it. I think this is more of a busman's holiday, preaching to the choir. And let's talk about the really reason that you'll shift your practice to LUS, lung ultrasound, which is we have three types of chest imaging that are available to us. You have on the lower left, the low quality, rotated, under, over penetrated, summation artifact, nonsensical chest film that has been torturing you for the last 50 or 100 years. Then you have the beautiful CAT scan as an option. And then higher in the hierarchy, you have the classic findings of lung ultrasonography. ICU chest radiography, it tortures us. It takes a three-dimensional uh, image and squeezes it down to two dimensions. It's always delayed, and this is an intensive care unit. It's not a care unit. You need results right away. 
There's a lot of inter-observer variability, a lot of confirmation bias, a lot of false positive negatives, non-standard term terminology by ICU people. What are the alternatives? Well, CAT scan or LUS. The advantages of lung ultrasound are obvious. Like all ultrasound, it's cheap compared to CAT scans. There are multiple platform options, everything from little UPUMs, ultra-portable ultrasound machines carried in your pocket, to full-service small footprint cart-mounted machines, ubiquitous in ICUs. It's ideal for bedside applications by the frontline team, and you can do it immediately serially in goal-directed manner. You can learn it quite quickly, and it removes con consultative imaging from the care loop. There's no delay in image acquisition or interpretation. There's no clinical dissociation. You live with the patient in the ICU, not in some back room in an armchair reading a, an image. And then the reporting the results is not delayed. It's there, right in front of you. And also, for lung ultrasound, the machine has multiple, multiple applications, general ultrasound, gold direct echo, advanced ST, all, all in one capable machine. So the other thing about lung ultrasound, which is that for the stuff in the ICU you're interested in, which would be um, pneumothorax, normal aeration pattern, interstitial patterns, consolidated pleural effusion, these are the, the findings that are relevant to us in the ICU. It results in findings that are rather similar to CAT scan, okay? And it's really good for rapid assessment of new onset respiratory failure, therefore, and also people who have established respiratory failure. And it's always combined, we agree, with echocardiography. I'll propose it as an, as an essential skill for all intensivists. I grew tired of pulling out all the articles. The number of articles that demonstrates that LUS is superior to chest film four ICU applications. I show what, eight? There, go to PubMed, Google, you, there are 80 of them. It just goes on and on. It's like a, a cottage industry of demonstration of the obvious point. Ultrasound for ICU applications is better than chest film for ultrasound uh, applications. And I think uh, Dr. Bose from Amsterdam will be talking to us about very interesting application. I don't want to get into it, it's too detailed. The distinction between cardiogenic pulmonary edema and ARDS. I'm looking forward to his talk. You know, but LUS has some limitation. First of all, if you have a two centimeter nodule surrounded by air, you're not gonna see it with ultrasound, you're gonna see it with a nice quality PA and lateral film. And are we interested in things like that in the ICU? Let someone else, let the respirologist take care of that. You know what I'm saying? So yes, that's a limitation. Um, and it's not good for, for looking at mediastinal structures. That's obvious, nor looking for pulmonary emboli. That's when you maybe have to turn to a CT scan. And then in the ICU, our patients are lying flat on their back. Some of them are large. In New York City, we got a lot of large people. And there, to look at the posterior thorax and the supine patient who critically ill, you have to do some work. One person holds the endotracheal tube to avoid unplanned tube removal. Another person hauls the patient over on their side gently, and the third person scans, and yeah, that's a lot of work. It's a lot easier than taking the patient out of the CAT scanner, so that is a limitation. It requires our physical involvement. There are some problems with storing and reviewing these very large image, image sets, uh, and then it requires you, you to do the um, imaging. There's some risk with all these things, with confirmation bias, and um, there's some controversy how you actually score results. That's another whole discussion. So what about the other alternative? Now I think I've convinced you to discount the chest film. CT. It's expensive, requires a lot of technical support, requires a whole radiology infrastructure. One CAT scanner 
You can buy 30 full service cart mounted machines. You can buy 200 ultra portable ultra mount machines. Why on earth a system would waste money on excessive number of CAT scans where they could literally equip an army of us with these machines? It's not a bedside technique. It's a delay in service interpretation reporting. You depend on someone else to do the work that rightfully you might want to do yourself. And uh, we hate to think about the 400 odd chest film exposures, more or less depending on the size of the patient. Every time you do a body scan, it's a lot of radiation. Well, before you do a CAT scan on a patient, why don't we wake them up and ask them, is all right we do 400 films on you when we could do it most like with a lung ultrasound? Do we ever ask, ask consent about that? I don't know. But it's a great technique for the mediastinum, pulmonary emboli, abnormalities that might be surrounded by aerated lung. It's easy to compare with serial images. They're really high quality. There's no doubt about that. But to compare the two, it's sort of like apples and oranges. They're very different operationally, conceptually. You should see them as complementary. The simple rule is if LUS does not answer the clinical question at hand, escalate to CT. That's, that's a pretty straightforward approach. And if you use that approach, uh, Dr. Oakes showed that you would greatly reduce the number of CT chest, uh, chest CTs in your unit. But always, when indicated, why are ICU teams still using chest films? Well, if you don't know how to do lung ultrasound, maybe your older generation, worse than that, maybe you come from a fellowship program that didn't train you to do it. Old habits die hard. I don't do it, and therefore, it's not effective, right? And the other thing is that being a PGY 44, been in the business for a while, I see that ICU people are sort of come in two flavors. The armchair practitioners, they're rounding in the back room. They round out in the hall. They don't engage with the patient. They don't up close and personal to smell them and feel them and hear them. Then there's another group who understand that the patient is the center of our attention and those are the people who like ultrasound because you gotta do it yourself, again and again and again. And what's really sad is, despite all the guidelines you read, all the right, there are some training programs that don't um, train their fellows to do this. Um, in the United States, on July 1st of this year, for the first time, all accredited fellowship programs, pulmonary critical care, critical care medicine, are mandating full training in general critical care ultrasound. It's an enormous breakthrough. This will develop a generation of capable scanners. Um, then access to machines, I see that as less and less of a problem because most um, units in the um, in you know, economic advantaged countries now do have some ultrasound machines because the vascular access guidance is very common. And the idea that they're too expensive when compared to the other stuff we do, once more, a very capable ultra portable machine is now about $5,000 in the United States. The larger cart ones are about 30, 33. And these are reasonable costs compared to um, uh, a lot of the other scanning techniques we use. So I'll propose to you if you're a clinical activist, if you're not an armchair intensivist, that you fully integrate lung ultrasound into ICU function. Of course, you have to have machines or machines. You can never have too many of them. 
And obviously, your team has to be trained in critical care. And uh, in the United States, that's a done deal. I think I've heard rumor about that in certain areas of Europe, Asia as well. And full integration into ICU operation is, um, by way of example, before I flew out, I was, did a final day of the week in the unit. So my past Friday, I decided to give a count. We were running, we were running about 16 cases at a time. So during this day, 34 lung ultrasound exams, only two chest radiographs, and they were done by the emergency department sending the patient up. We did two chest CTs for pulmonary embolism evaluation and mediastinal assessment. I regret to say that, but I admit it. Fellows scanned, ultrasound rotators at resident level. We offer that. All my partners are good at it. We also did 19 goal direct echoes, three full advanced echo studies, and just one TEE. And in reference to my colleague who spoke to us about abdominal, sort of did a bunch of miscellaneous goal-directed abdominal things, um, two DVT studies, and I didn't even keep track of the abdominal stuff. Uh, so I'll make the following proposal. ICU chest radiography, let it rest in peace. I see there its tombstone with some pretty flowers. It's rather like the De Chavot that my father drove for about six or seven years in the 60s when we lived in Switzerland. A great vehicle, but time to withdraw it from service. And instead, let LUS and General Care Ultrasound and Advanced Care Care OT, let it rise and shine. And we have here what uh, Vieille Baron would like, a transesophageal lung ultrasound image of a complete translobar consolidation of the uh, right lower lobe with mobile air bronchograms. And our friends in Amsterdam have now reported that if you see this pattern with mobile air bronchograms, there is an extraordinarily high probability that it's pneumonia. By the way, I regret, over there in the corner, hidden away occasionally, I regret a CT. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Very controversial, but uh, yeah, let's have a question. Can we, can we have a micro microphone, yeah, please? There's a microphone. I might just get you to wait for the microphone. Paul, I'm not sure people can hear you either at the back. Maybe you could use the microphone too. The question is, when would it be reasonable to do a chest film? And I'm embarrassed to say that, like you, we still order them to check for line placement. And it turns out there's a substantial literature that you can use ultrasonography very, very effectively to document appropriate central line placement. The problem is it's sort of laborious. You have to you get the probe, get the right window, and then be OK with echo a little bit, and then shoot in agitated saline contrast, and then look for the swirling pattern or the delayed pattern. Gee, that, that's pretty. So we still do them for that, although you don't have to. But there is an interesting application for line insertion. First of all, always check for pneumothorax pre and post, right, when you're doing neck, le neckline. And then especially subclavians, sometimes it's hard to document that the wire is in the vessel and you would never dilate a central line unless you document the wires in the vessel. About 95% of the time, you can see it in the IVC with a lateral view. 
So if you see the wire in the IVC and the little pigtail tip, and you're sure it's there, you can dilate that even if you can't track into the vessel. The other application which, uh, sadly, I still would permit in my unit is to check endotracheal tube position. It turns out that with um, ultrasound, you can do a pretty good job with that, but it takes too long for a busy team. So, like you, line placement and endotracheal tube placement, because it saves a lot of time. But all the other stuff, <clears throat> lung ultrasound is the way to go. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, sir, over there. Another clinical situation like mediastinal emphysema uh, in its early stage, which can be identified by just doing one chest X-ray, but ultrasound takes time to identify, unless you have surgical emphysema in the neck, and then you will be able to. And yeah. the other thing is early pulmonary embolism, where you can have just high perlucence in one side, which may not be picked up with. Uh, so you cannot just do chest X RIP. It has got a role, I think. Yeah. Um, we have a joke, which if you want to drive a cardiologist crazy, call him to do an echo in a patient who has sub-Q emphysema. <laughs> and, the reason for that is what, that's one of the limitations of lung ultrasound, that subcutaneous emphysema will block um, uh, ultrasound. If you press resolutely, you can sometimes push through it. That's a limitation. And uh, mediastinal um, emphysema is very interesting because in the supine patient, it usually is a anter little anterior. So during COVID, we had a lot of trouble with this, and um, we would... Um, attempt TE in those patients to get behind the heart, but sometimes there was so much uh, emphysema that it would surround the esophagus, and the heart became invisible. Very tough patient, which we saw occasionally, but that's uh, definitely a limitation. Pulmonary emboli, in general, will have, unless there's underlying lung disease, A-line pattern, unless you are a very skilled, like, Italian level uh, ultrasonographer, where uh, it's been reported that very small subpleural consolidation pattern in the lower lobe distribution occurs with pulmonary emboli. You have to have other clinical evidence, but I would not rely on that because it's very hard to do very carefully, but there's a little literature about that. Obviously, sadly, once the DVT study is negative and you have a clinical suspicion and there's no alternative exhalation on ultrasound, you may be stuck, in, stuck with doing a, a CT angio. I mean, that's the way it is, yeah. There was another question over there I saw. Yes, yes. I'm going to have to make it brief. I'm afraid yeah. to go. Nice ultrasound. It's the, it's the glasses I dreamed of when I was training. But I do have a, a, an objective question. You said that you f you'll see the, at the tip of the wire in the inferior IVC. Do you have a second person under the drapes? And do well, you have a second machine that's non-sterile to get that done? That's the problem with all this line stuff. It's sort of complicated. But there's a study out of Israel where somehow a single operator figured out how to put the pre-position, the probe under the, and they could manipulate through the drape. I, I've never been able to do that. So, but that, it's one of the problems. So if you, you have to have two operators, one remains sterile, and that's a limitation. That's why. It's interesting, but it's sort of inefficient. Yeah, okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll move on. But thank, thanks very much indeed, Paul. <laughs> we're gonna stay with the lung, uh, but now we're gonna talk about ARDS, and uh, Liu Boss from uh, Amsterdam is going to do just that. Please. So I was gonna hate on, on chest imaging with uh, chest X-ray for 15 minutes, but I guess that's already done, so I'll tell you something else. Um, I'm going to talk about phenotyping ARDS using lung ultrasound. And we now already learned that lung ultrasound is very good. It uh, images where air and fluid meets. 
and you can get all these different patterns um, uh, based on the amount of air present in the structure that we're interested in and the structure in this case is the lung. So we're going from pneumothorax all the way down to pleural effusion which is pure water and everything in between. So if we classify these uh, lung ultrasound patterns, let me remind you that uh, there are a couple of patterns that we do recognize. So the first one is A, which means air. The second is B, suggestive of uh, decreased aeration of the lung. C, complete consolidation of the lung. And E, effusion. Those are the key terms to remember. And um, if you look at this image, uh, then you can see all those patterns at the same time. So over here, there is A, which is an artifact. So it's not true, but it's based on the, uh, on the properties, uh, the different properties of air and tissue. This is B1, so B lines, but still some uh, normal tissue in between, an artifact. <coughs> B2 complete uh, uh, B pattern throughout this part of the uh, lung tissue. A con small consolidation in the top, which is real. This is true image and an effusion over here. So basically that's all you need to know to classify any um, uh, image that you're gonna see. So it's a very limited vocabulary that I think we can all master. So before I'm going to talk about ARDS phenotypes, I want to spend uh, two minutes on ARDS diagnosis. I know it's not something we might always do at the bedside, but would you like to diagnose ARDS? Lung ultrasound is a very good alternative for that, and uh, it's actually supported now by the global definition of ARDS. Um, and I want you to, to share uh, three slides on a recent study led by uh, Murray Smith, who's in the room here from Amsterdam, where we took patients in a derivation cohort in Amsterdam and a validation cohort in Maastricht, and basically did lung ultrasound, 12 regions, on every patient that got into the ICU and had respiratory failure. And then we looked at the changes in the, or at the different lung uh, patterns in patients without ARDS, which are at the top corner, uh, oh, there's no pointer, but at the top left corner on both sides, up to patients with certain ARDS on the right upper corner of each of the graphs. And then uh, looking at both the uh, superior part of the lung and the anterior part, anterior lateral and posterior part of the lung. And what you can recognize is that there is an increase in the number of B lines and the number of consolidations in the patients with ARDS. And that the difference between patients with and without ARDS is mostly driven by anterolateral differences in the aeration of the lung. So because, of course, patients without ARDS frequently have consolidation on the back due to atelectasis. So Mari went a little bit further than that and tried to develop a lung ARDS prediction score based on the derivation cohort and tested the accuracy of that in the validation cohort. And um, using uh, logistic regression techniques, she came up with a score where you take the left <coughs> lung ultrasound duration score, the right lung ultrasound duration score, and the pleural line abnormalities in the antro and lateral regions that adds up a score, and that score gives you a probability of ARDS being present or not. I'm gonna hate a little bit on the chest X-ray just because we all like that so much. Um, we then compared the LUS ARDS score, the red line in an ROC curve with three operators looking at the CT scans of patients that also had CT scans. Those are the green dots in these figures. And you can see that the CT scans are slightly better than the lung ultrasound scores. And then we also had 11 operators look at chest X-rays of these patients. So all of the patients got chest X-rays as well. And what you can see is that the operators could have 100% sensitivity and 50% specificity, but could also have 100% specificity and 50% uh, uh, sensitivity and everything in between. So depending on who you ask to read the chest X-ray, you would get wildly varying prevalences of the target condition 
which means it's, it's useless in clinical practice because it just depends on the doctor that's at your bedside. And I mean that is, that is used as an argument against lung ultrasound sometimes, but honestly, because we just have four flavors, it's much easier to assess the images. So in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to talk not about diagnosis, but about phenotyping of these patients. So when we have looked at patients in the ICU, we have generally taken an approach without any enrichment. That means we took patients that fulfilled the cl clinical syndrome, like ARDS or sepsis, but in this case ARDS, and we enrolled them in the trial and we said, okay, we're going to compare a high PEEP strategy versus a low PEEP strategy. And what we have learned in the, in the past 30 years is that that's ineffective. I mean, we now have more than 50 RCTs in ARDS patients, more than 100 in sepsis patients, that in unselected populations, we're not, never going to find that benefit. So then we move to prognostic enrichment, selecting patients that have a higher probability of meeting the primary endpoint of the study. <coughs> so when you include sicker patients, it's easier to outweigh the risk of the intervention towards the benefit of the intervention. And that is sometimes effective. Indeed, when you use prone positioning in severely hypoxemic patients, there seems to be a benefit. And especially for VV ECMO, the selection of the patient probably drives the beneficial effect. While if you would apply, uh, apply that in a general population, that would not be very efficient. But what I'm going to talk about now is called predictive enrichment. So not based on the probability of the patient meeting the primary endpoint, but selecting patients for the probability that they will respond favorably to the intervention that you're studying. So I think that's, that's the future, and that's what we call sometimes precision medicine, even though that might be a bit of an overambitious term. So when we talk about precision medicine, the first step that we have to take is identify subgroups of patients that are quantitatively different. So groups of patients that are not, well, it's not like a limit on a PF scale, but they have a truly different uh, condition, a disease trait, and might uh, benefit from specific treatments. And when we were talking about lung injury and lung aeration, we have two of those. So already from the 2000s, described by J.J. Ruby in intensive care medicine, two uh, of these patterns have been described, called focal lung morphology with consolidations on the dorsal inferior part of the lung, while normal aeration in the rest of the lung compared to non-focal lung morphology, which can be either diffuse or patchy, but it doesn't really matter, which distributes far more throughout the lung and has a different response to treatments. So we have these subphenotypes, and we sort of jumped ahead without developing point-of-care tests, without prospective validation, to repurposing targeted therapies. And the targeted therapies in this, ca in this case were um, uh, mechanical ventilation strategies. So I'm going to spend uh, some words on the LIFE study coming from France by uh, uh, Professor Constantin from Paris. And I think this is the, one of the most revolutionary studies done in critical care in the past 10 years because they had the courage to predefine what patients would benefit from interventions that we thought were only applicable to an unselected population. So they had a control group ventilated according to the guidelines and compared that to a personalized group. That personalized group was then separated in focal lung morphology or non-focal lung morphology. Focal patients were put into the prone positioning and on, put on a low PEEP strategy with uh, recruitment ma uh, maneuvers rarely used, while the non-focal lung morphology received lower tidal volumes, received a high PEEP strategy, and recruitment maneuvers were used in every patient, and prone positioning was only used when the PF ratio remained below 150, despite this optimization of mechanical ventilation. So in the intention to treat analysis of this study, there was absolutely no difference between the two groups. But what's interesting is that they had the uh, imaging reviewed by the local investigator, which drove the random or the allocation of the patient into the focal or non-focal uh, phenotype, but had an independent review committee that at a central stage also reviewed the imaging, 
who was blinded to the intervention that the patient got in the end, and they sometimes disagreed with the clinical team. This is the per protocol analysis. Here, only patients that were correctly classified and correctly allocated were included. And all of a sudden, there was a strong beneficial effect of the intervention. When we then split the patients into the control group on the left and the personalized group on the right, and into correctly classified with the solid lines and incorrectly classified with the dashed lines, you can observe that in the control group there's absolutely no difference between the uh, uh, correctly uh, classified and the misclassified patients. Of course not, because they all received the same intervention. But in the intervention arm, in the personalized group, there was a uh, major harm to the patients who were misclassified, with mortality rates going up to 60-70%. So this is a major issue using any technology any subphenotyping and trying to outsmart the situation where you're treating unselected patients. There's always the harm of misclassification and harm due to intervention. So in this study, one of the problems was that they, they anticipated that every patient would get a chest CT. But that's unfeasible and undoable. So in, in the end, only 80% oh, 80 of the patients was classified based on the chest X-ray rather than the CT. And we already knew from 2001 that patients with a chest uh, X-ray were not classifiable into this lower or diffuse of what we call now focal or non-focal uh, uh, classifications. So it's useless. So I'm going back, going back to lung ultrasound now because uh, uh, Haralampos Priakos and Mary Smith, they both developed a uh, method for uh, classifying patients into focal and non-focal ARDS and uh, validated that method in an other <coughs> cohort in uh, Italy where patients got simultaneous lung ultrasound and CT imaging. And this classification method is much more accurate than the chest X-ray. So we're now uh, setting out with the Pegasus study, which is basically a repeat of the LIFE study with very similar control group and intervention arms, but now using lung ultrasound imaging as the way to classify patients into the two phenotypes. This study has the same primary endpoint of 90-day mortality and some secondary endpoints that are on the slide. So to conclude, the population can be split based on these lung morphology subphenotypes. And we absolutely have to get rid of the chest X-ray when we do these kind of very sophisticated classifications and randomizations in order to get a beneficial effect. And I think this truly can be useful for predictive enrichment strategies in uh, ventilator studies because misclassification seems to be very hard, harmful and we truly need prospective subphenotype-informed RCTs, so we need to combine the best imaging method that we have that is available at the bedside and start to apply them in the randomized control trials that we need to get the best evidence possible. So in Pegasus, I'm very positive that we're going to um, uh, continue enrollment. We are currently up in 11 countries and uh, have almost included the first 80 patients. I can um, tell you in secret that there's almost no misclassification between the lung ultrasound images and the chest CTs that were done in most of the patients simultaneously. And if you're still interested in this topic, you can uh, talk to me after this presentation and join our study. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Are there any questions? Oh, I think we've got one. Uh, thank you for your presentation. What, uh, what I would like to point out or, or challenge is that first, uh, for those of us who have experience in lung ultrasound, know that uh, examining patterns of uh, consolidation is um, takes time uh, to identify and to clinically correlate all the patterns. My main problem with this project, and that what I would like to ask you, is that you are associating 
one intervention, which for me is far from being consensual in critical care medicine, which are recruitment maneuvers or that distribution of prone positioning. And you apply a method of monitoring, which is ultrasound, which is great and which I use all the time, that does not control for over distension. So for me, that leaves a safety problem mm -hmm. uh, because you are not con addressing potential over distension. Uh, you're only checking if the recruitment you make uh, diminishes lung ultrasound score. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question and sorry to have left that unclear. Um, so we are not doing monitoring. So it's basically you get the patient, you put them on five centimeters of water of PEEP. Um, you classify based on the lung ultrasound images in 12 regions into either focal or non-focal. And based on their classification at the first stage, they're going to enter the study. They're randomized to intervention or control. In the intervention arm, the treatment is based on whether they are non-focal or focal. If they're non-focal, you're right, they're going to get recruitment maneuvers in high peak because we think they are more recruitable. Actually, the data suggests that these patients are more recruitable. I would point out that the standard of care does not allow for any assessment of overdistension other than a plateau pressure of above 28 centimeters of water. Because there is no other test of overdistension. And don't start me on EIT, because I think that is available in some clinics. But there is no good data that EIT assessment would uh, result in a better outcome of any of these patients. So what we have built into the protocol is that if plateau pressures would exceed what would be acceptable in normal limits, it's allowed to deviate from the randomized group the patient is in and decrease the uh, PEEP in that patient group. Because we don't want to give the harm to the patient due to the protocol, but at the same time, in a study with 50, 60 centers in 11 countries, you cannot expect everyone to have advanced monitoring like EIT. Certainly not because it's not guideline-based and it's not evident that it would improve the outcomes at this moment. Okay, um, in the interest of time, um, thank you so much for this very insightful talk. Um, and we move on to the last um, talk of this session. And I think it's very, 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 a very interesting um, perspective uh, to involve also nursing staff into our diagnostic and monitoring um, um, activities on our ICUs. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Paul Elvis to give us an insight how to integrate the nursing staff into uh, our practice. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for that, uh, that very kind uh, introduction. And um, uh, not to disappoint you, but I fully agree with the chair here. So, uh, but I'm going to tell you why. And uh, I also uh, uh, want to um, uh, publicly thank uh, Professor Antoine Vier Baron because uh, in 2011 he allowed uh, uh, Professor uh, Daniel Lichtenstein, uh, who uh, works with him, to uh, teach me ultrasound in two days. And that led to many uh, good things. And one of these things is that we uh, came up uh, with the term ultra nurse. Uh, and we showed in 2019 that it is feasible to teach point of care ultrasound to intensive care nurses. So the most important giveaway from this talk would be that this is teamwork. So, so I do want to mention uh, my colleagues, Harry Gedesen, Erik Lust, and Peter Tuinman, who really are taking this now to the, to the next level. But predominantly, the ultranurses, and one of them is the first author of uh, this paper, uh, Amy Maria de Tulliken. So I was very glad to see that during COVID, it was even called a weapon against COVID-19. Uh, but the, the reason we set it up it was basically to, to be more together at the bedside because, because, at least in our center, nurses spend more time at the bedside than, than doctors. And we were thinking, how can we make ultrasound a more dynamic parameter that, it, that it's being used more often and maybe used to titrate therapy at the bedside of critically ill patients? Also, there is a worrying trend that I observed that there seems to be less and less interest in measuring 
cardiac output or circuits thereof. And, uh, and me being trained as a, uh, as a physiologist and uh, also liking physiology, for me that's very hard to understand because of the basic mathematics behind optimizing circulatory therapy. And, uh, but, the, but, the, but, the, but the best reason, and it still is, is, is because you, if, if you introduce this program of ultra nurse, you really get to work as a team. So, I will uh, now show you how we did this uh, in order to encourage you to just copy that or maybe even improve uh, uh, upon it. And, um, and I suspect that this audience uh, is well aware of the possibilities of ultrasound, so that might be a bit um, a, a low level uh, lecture, but I still think it's important because as you see here in red, the whole thing is, it means hands-on, 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 so you cannot uh, learn ultrasound if you don't do it. So, so, uh, uh, but it can be done in a very efficient way because we only did a four-hour theoretical course and then a four-hour training session. But I'll talk more about that later. So we focused on uh, a very limited number of, uh, of uh, points. In the tradition of uh, Daniel Liechtenstein, we focused on the blue one and the blue two points and also the PLAPS point. I'll come back to that later. And uh, probably revolutionary, uh, and uh, I expect uh, some criticism also, we also uh, put in the uh, left ventricular outflow tract velocity time integral as a proxy for cardiac index. So, first of all, the lung. So, the, the reason uh, to limit our uh, uh, points is because too many points would kill the point, and we wanted to, this to be very simple. So, blue one left, blue two left, plaps left, and the other thing, uh, and similarly to the right. And um, you, you probably know all this by now, so here are the blue one and blue two points, and we are teaching this also to the nurses. And then we have, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the PLEPS point, uh, which, uh, which stands for the posterior lateral alveolar and or pleural syndrome, but it basically means, is there a consolidation or is there a pleural effusion? So, um, our, our theoretical course, of course, and, uh, and uh, uh, Liva Boss uh, in the previous lecture also already pointed this out, of recognizing uh, patterns. So uh, you see here the, the, the seizure sign and the barcode sign, discriminating uh, plural movements uh, versus uh, no plural movements. And um, on the left you see, uh, as Liva already uh, pointed out, the A pattern, in the middle is the B pattern, and the C pattern to the right. Uh, we were doing a uh, little deepening on the number of B lines at the time. At the time, we thought it was very important to make the distinction between uh, more or less than three B lines. Um, now I think that uh, it's maybe maybe less important. And also the the posterior lateral alveolar or pleural syndrome. And um, uh, Teaching uh, uh, nurses uh, to do ultrasound is actually very easy because these, these uh, items are very easy to grasp. So we also told them to come up with a, a proposed diagnosis and we used the blue protocol. So now this is a little tricky of course but because you all know that this blue protocol has not been uh, validated for intensive care uh, uh, medicine. It has been uh, uh, produced for the setting of uh, emergency medicine. Uh, it has certainly not been validated for use uh, 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 for ICU uh, nurses, and it also um, embeds a, a, a so-called venous analysis. So we had to replace that uh, with um, uh, any reason to suspect a pulmonary embolism uh, because of the patient history or because of other findings. But it was just basically to have some kind of structure also for the nurses to, to help us uh, with, uh, with some diagnosis. So now then for the left ventricular outflow tract uh, velocity time integral. So this is of course uh, uh, obtained using a, a pulsed uh, wave uh, Doppler and that allows you to calculate the, the product of the velocity versus time, which basically gives you a stroke distance. So the uh, amount, the uh, blood that is propelled from uh, uh, through the aortic valve in one heartbeat. So the distance of that, of that uh, volume. And uh, you can easily say why that would be important, because the, the, the VTI times the area of the LVOT times the heart rate equals cardiac output. But we didn't want to go into measuring the LVOT area, because that is known to be <coughs> very uh, uh, prone to, um, to making uh, mistakes. Uh, uh, and also because uh, you can argue that the VTI is a good proxy for cardiac index, because the area of the 
of the uh, LVOT is very likely to differ with anthropomorphics. So, so that basically means that uh, the best proxy for uh, cardiac index is probably uh, your velocity time integral with normal values of around, uh, well, 16 to 25 centimeters. So in order to do that, you need to teach your ultra nurses how to do cardiac ultrasound. And that is actually a lot harder because, uh, and this is what we taught them. So we, 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 we taught them how to do an epical four chamber and then um, uh, move the, propo, uh, the, 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 the beam direction a bit more interior to obtain the five chamber, uh, rotate anti-clockwise until the right side of the heart would disappear to have a two chamber and finally the uh, three chamber in which the aortic valve comes back into view and you see that in the right lower corner. And of course, we also needed to teach them how to position the pulse wave Doppler two to four, <coughs> about two centimeters under the aortic valve uh, to look for aortic clicks uh, to make sure there's no uh, a flow acceleration. So all the usual caveats, which is kind of uh, difficult to grasp if you've never done that. Uh, so we provided them with practical tips. Some of them I already told you, uh, but, but uh, an important thing is that the gates should be two to four millimeters and the, the ultrasound beam should be aligned uh, with the direction of flow because otherwise you will, uh, you, you, you will definitely not get a good estimation. So we said to them that uh, over 20 degrees would definitely not be acceptable. So more about more on that later. Um, we had a standard uh, uh, re uh, reporting um, uh, scheme and uh, it, it basically consisted uh, of um, uh, yes, no answers for all the uh, points. And uh, so this is in Dutch, but you probably recognize that in the right upper corner, it also said, uh, says supervisor because these ultra nurses were in training, so they were supervised, but it also allowed us to uh, assess uh, how fast their uh, learning curve uh, was. Uh, so uh, similarly, they needed to specify some diagnostic uh, elements here based on the uh, lung uh, ultrasound. I think you'll recognize the terms even though they are again in, in Dutch. And for the LVOT VTI, it was a very simple reporting form. They just needed to put down the number of centimeters they measured. And uh, that was then uh, estimated uh, by the supervisor. So we did not have the supervisor do the ultrasound again. But based on uh, uh, what uh, he or she saw, uh, it, uh, he, may, he or she made an uh, assessment of uh, uh, what, whether or not he thought it was reasonable or uh, not at all. So, um, if you do a course, we think in Amsterdam you, you, you do need a certificate, even though it might be bread and butter, but it is definitely motivating to hand out certificates. So we had a certificate after the theoretical part, after attending the course but also after the practical part. And uh, we set uh, the bar uh, uh, to be uh, fully certified uh, uh, after five ultra-nurse examinations, but that's not, that does not mean five ultra-nurse ultra examinations. It, only five ultra-nurse examinations that were executed without assistance, reported on without assistance, and fully approved by the supervisor as being correct. So, uh, so that We'll see, you'll see in a few slides how many uh, uh, exams they needed, but it was more than five, of course, I can tell you already. And uh, we also provided them with, uh, with nice uh, batches so they could stand out between uh, colleagues. So you, so you would first get a batch of ultra-nurse in training and then uh, ultra-nurse certified if you, would, uh, if you would read that. So that led to uh, this publication. Uh, so you can, you can read the whole protocol. It's, it's a little hard to uh, find because it was published as a letter. So the real paper is actually the, um, the uh, supplementary materials. You need to do a little, little extra download to get the, to get the full details. So uh, what you see there for the blue points, the, the, the learning curve was very, 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 was reached very, very, very fast. So even after about four, five, six uh, exams, uh, it already uh, uh, nicely converged to, uh, to, a, to a straight line. And that was also the case for the, uh, for the PLAPS points for, as, uh, as far as image quality is concerned. So this is adjusted for the amount of assistance uh, required. That's the score we, we developed for that. But for the LVOT VTI, it was different. So it took, it took much longer. So, so you, could, you might even say it doesn't plateau here, right? So, uh, but at least 20 seem to be needed here. Uh, we also had a, a proficiency score uh, was based on the, uh, the, uh, the rating of the supervisor of overall proficiency. Shows a bit of the same number, so uh, six, seven, eight uh, uh, ultrasounds needed to become proficient in lung ultrasound. For VTI, more difficult, but I would say 20, maybe, maybe a bit more. 
So then my, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Peter Teinman uh, led uh, another study with the ultra nurses to, to see if it would actually have an effect uh, on the management of adult intensive care unit patients. And guess what it did, right? It, 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 uh, it resulted in a change in management in about 26% of patients and even diagnosis in 7%. And, and change in management was mainly related, uh, uh, I think about 40 to 50%, uh, in changes related to uh, fluid management, so uh, mostly uh, prescribing uh, uh, diuretics uh, or even uh, plural, uh, plural drainage. So, um, I'm very fond of this project because it, uh, it, really, um, it really helps to build uh, teams, but it, uh, it does lead to all kinds of discussion. So, who, who is responsible for the, for the decisions? Uh, especially when something goes wrong and who's liable and uh, who is paying because it does cost time. I mean, if you're good, you can do this in one minute, but uh, in the beginning, uh, the, the nurses took about one hour. And I have to also confess something because uh, uh, in uh, uh, the last year, these are two of our, uh, our ultra nurses, uh, Brian and Soyan, they wanted to check if, uh, if the learning curve uh, still held. Uh, because there, we had had COVID in between and we had some new cohorts of ultra nurses. So they did, they did a reality check and uh, under the assumption that uh, ultra nurses had performed a wide variation in the number of exams because of different uh, contracts, other tasks, patient workloads. And, uh, so they expected there would be expanding differences in experience. And you, you actually see that, that uh, if you bin the number of ultrasounds made by ultra nurses, that, that, that it differs a lot. And uh, they did a study in which they uh, had uh, uh, 15 images uh, that were pre-recorded and they, they tried to uh, tease out the inter-rater uh, reliability using Kappa scores and they are detrimental. So I just have a quick look, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna push this slide away because that's not very good, right? So, so I was actually thinking that he would recommend us to stop the program, but luckily he recommended to do more. And I think that's, the, that's a good thing, right? Because I think it, it's a matter of keeping up the training. So he recommended to do refresher courses to do at least 25 exams per year. He didn't propose help for my AI. I just put that in because uh, that's uh, my other topic. So I think that might be, might be useful. But the, but the real value of this program is, I, is still, I think, is hands-on, uh, hands-on, hands-on. And, uh, and even though uh, the, the latest results might be a little disappointing, I still strongly believe in this and, uh, and because, because if, that would, if this would work, right? So I was talking to Michel Slama. Uh, over lunch, but if this would work, you would truly make ultrasound a dynamic parameter for all your patients. Uh, but uh, moreover, uh, you really start becoming a team if you're not already a team, and that is that is super important in intensive care medicine. So with that, I hope you follow me, and uh, I thank you, and uh, let's have a beer. Thanks, Paul. Terrific. You, you answered my question about the continuing uh, requirement for experience, so, so thank you. Are there any other questions for, for Paul? What, 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 is, what is the level of... Here. I'm here. Paul. Paul. I'm the mod here. Oh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I said, what is, what, is, what is the motivation of the nurses to become in, involved in this, in this project? Because we, and when, when I look back on some similar initiatives, when we basically involved nursing staff into some diagnostic processes, I mean, the motivation was quite high because they felt, you know, recognized by us. They felt, you know, being important, being a member of the team, and this was, Probably the, the motivation was quite high, what would assume, among, among your, your staff, right? Yeah, so I, I would say it varies a lot, right? So, uh, yes, the motivation is high among, uh, um, among enthusiastic nurses, and, uh, they, and it, it does offer an opportunity for them to, to stand out. However, they also feel that uh, some of the work that doctors usually do may be laid off onto them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that might be a barrier. Uh, we did provide them uh, with, uh, with time off, I mean, so paid time to do the course, mm -hmm. uh, but they had to invest uh, time of their own to uh, become certified. And that actually was uh, a bit of putting for some of them because uh, as you can re remember probably from your learning curves, so the first ultrasounds 
go a lot slower than the, the last ones. Mm. Okay. Yeah, one question. Microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words uh, initially. Um, no, short question. What is in your unit the ratio nurse patients? My, my question is, uh, do they have uh, uh, enough time to, to be involved in such a, a busy project? Well, so uh, it differs a lot. So currently there's a major nursing shortage in the Netherlands. So, so it's kind of hard to do, uh, to do things in a good way now. But uh, in general, it's uh, it should be about uh, two nurses for a patient, sometimes 1.5 for a patient. So that should probably be allow, allow for enough time to do that. But I know there's wide differences between different countries. So it's probably very region specific. Oh, another question? Yeah, just a follow-up one. Thank you. Uh, hello, excellent talk. Uh, what were the average ages of the, the ultra nurses? And did, did they volunteer or did, were they approached or how did you recruit them? Yeah, so, so luckily in the Netherlands you cannot force uh, people to do this, so they, they volunteered. Um, and so we have a different group, but so the first group of, uh, of eight ultra nurses, they would have been uh, between, uh, uh, I would say, 25 and 50, uh, with a, a, a predominance of younger ones, because you see the enthusiasm uh, starts with a younger generation. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, we heard great talks, including great discussions um, about the vast spectrum of the use of ultrasound in ICU settings in different organs or for different